If you go to Stonehenge, as people do from all over the world, you can see what the mystery is about. The place is so remarkable in itself that you do not at first ask it. But the more you look, the more you wonder, as Professor Hawkins did. What was it for? Who built it? And how was it done? You can do Stonehenge in half an hour and take away an ashtray souvenir. But most people get more from these ruins. Everyday people know they're touching greatness here. The traditional tour of Stonehenge begins here at the Heelstone. 350,000 people come here to stare at it every year. Professor Atkinson told me that sarsen is a peculiar stone, an ancient sea-bottom sandstone harder than granite. There are 35 tons of it in this boulder. The heel stone has been here from the beginning. The Stone Age farmers raised it outside the earliest Stonehenge. This wide ditch and bank enclosed that first sanctuary, a circle 350 feet across. Just inside the bank lie the 56 Aubrey holes, 16 feet apart. They are so precisely spaced that today it would take a surveying team to lay them out. To add to their mystery, some of the Aubrey holes had human cremations in them, added years later. A computer? Dr. Hawkins will try to prove it. Stonehenge's second phase, long since dismantled and rearranged, was once a double circle of the smaller blue stones. Eighty of them, weighing some four tons each, were brought from Priscelli, a sacred mountain 140 miles away on the coast of Wales. Its peak is jagged with blue stones. Its slopes are sharp with them. Down below them on the slopes, there are great screes of boulders from which the builders of Stonehenge selected the stones they wanted. From the Priscillian Mountains, the blue stones would have to be dragged overland to Milford Haven, a great landlocked natural harbor in the south of Pembrokeshire. There they were probably loaded on rafts or boats of some kind and carried most of the rest of the way to Stonehenge by water, by sea along the south coast of Wales, then by various rivers in England, finishing up with the River Avon, about two miles from Stonehenge. From the bank of the Avon, they probably took the last part of their journey again on sledges, coming up the Stonehenge Avenue over the downs and finishing at the entrance of the Stoneworks itself. The blue stones of the second Stonehenge are small beside the great Stonehenge three Sarsons. Their name comes from Saracen, or foreign stone, and there were once 30 of them topped with lintels in a towering circle with a horseshoe of tall archways at the center. The Sarsons were brought here from Marlborough Downs, some 20 miles to the north. Marlborough is a rolling chalk downland, and still in many places, you can see on the surface a thick scatter of big sarsen boulders lying just buried in the grass. We don't really know how they were dragged here, but imagination can help us to reconstruct the picture. First, the stones would have had to be cut down to size to save dragging extra weight. They could light fires along the edges. Then pour cold water on the heated lines to crack the stone and drop heavy rocks on them till they split. After that, load them on to big timber sleds and drag them over a track of rollers laid down in front. With 1,500 men at work, it would have taken 10 years to get those stones to Stonehenge. This staggering feat called for further explanation from Dr. Atkinson. Who built Stonehenge, Professor? 
Well, as far as we know, it was built by the local barbarian population of this part of the world in the early Bronze Age. How could barbarians build something like this? Well, barbarians, after all, aren't savages. Uh, they're not civilized either, in the sense that they don't live in cities. But uh, barbarians are people who do have skills like these people in metalworking, in the importation of raw materials from distant places. They were clearly capable of doing this kind of thing. But this must have had an architect, an organizer, because something like this couldn't merely have been in a culmination of folk wisdom that just grew organically. Yeah, I'm sure there was an architect. This is one of the very few prehistoric monuments in Europe where you can be sure that somebody who was a real designer, a real architect in the modern sense of the word, uh, had a hand in the job and wasn't just a builder. Well, do you think that he was a Briton or that he came here from somewhere else? I think it's far more probable that he came from outside, probably from the Mediterranean and perhaps from the Mycenaean world in Greece. Well, were they farther ahead at that time than uh, the Britons? Very much more so. I mean, this is a, a civilization in the true sense of the word, people living in towns of all the specialization of labor and supply of finished goods and so on, which is associated with town life. Besides the architectural similarities, are there any other indications of this Mediterranean influence you suspect? Well, there's one right behind you, which uh, a good many of us at any rate believe to be a representation of an actual Mycenaean dagger, the kind of dagger which has been found in the royal tombs at Mycenae, the shaft graves, the burial places of the ancestors of Agamemnon. But isn't this Mediterranean influence uh, a fairly recent concept? And that dagger's been there for 4,000 years. Yes, but it was only found uh, in 1953, quite by accident, when we were photographing modern names carved on the same stone. Professor Atkinson, how did they get a stone which might weigh as much as 50 tons upright and sunk into the ground? Well, that's something I think we can best show on a model. Well, the first thing they had to do, of course, in order to get a stone upright, was to dig a hole like this. A hole with the back vertical and lined with uh, wooden stakes to protect it, and a sloping ramp on the other side. And when that had been dug, then the stone would be brought up to it on rollers like these, and rolled in, until its toe was over the hole. Then they'd put packing close underneath the outside end, the top end of the stone, and that would enable them to lift the end fairly easily with levers because most of the weight of the stone is towards the bottom and it's more or less balanced on the front roller. And these levers could lift it a few inches at a time like this. And then, of course, they'd put packing underneath to hold it and build up the levers higher and lift again a few inches of time and so on. And eventually the stone, when it was nearly down into the hole, would slip and come to rest in that sort of position. But then you've got to fight the force of gravity to get the thing standing up straight. Yes, they did. And I think this was done, again, mainly by levering at any rate in the first stages. Probably what they did was to build up a crisscross frame of timbers notched where they cross so they don't roll like this uh, in order to support levers uh, much higher up, up here. There isn't time for me to build the whole of this for you, but you can see the idea. Yeah. This would enable you to get levers under the stone up here towards the top, and then again the thing could be levered up a few inches at a time. And in this way they could get it up to somewhere about here. Then they'd have to attach ropes to the top, I think with a frame like this of timbers lashed around the top. And a team of men stationed out here could haul on the ropes and bring the stone upright like that. But then, of course, they had to get the lintel on. Yes. Well, now, the lintel would be drawn up on a sledge like this, and I think it would be raised in very much the same way with a crisscrossed frame, a crib of timbers. The lintel would be put, first of all, on the ground here, and then raised with levers a couple of feet off the ground 
resting on timber packing. Then this frame of timbers would be built round underneath it and decked over. And the stone would then rest on the deck and could be raised again a couple of feet in stages in the same way until it was up level with the top. Now, of course, it's fixed in place. There are projecting knobs or tenons on tops of the uprights and on the underside of the lintel there are these mortise holes and the thing fits on top like that. Professor Atkinson, you've given us a good idea of when Stonehenge was built and of who built it and of how it was built. But why was it built? I think this is the one question you, that you really can't hope to answer. This is the great mystery of Stonehenge, and I think it will always be a mystery. The difficulty is that when you're dealing with archaeological evidence, with the material remains of the past, you can't really answer the question why things were done. Archaeology doesn't deal in human motives. I think everybody is more or less agreed that Stonehenge was a temple, but having said that, you really said all that you can about the why of it. When you're dealing with prehistory, you have to deal with the work of men's hands, but you can't get at their minds. When you reach for their minds, they slip through your fingers. But Dr. Hawkins refused to let the Stonehenge mine slip through his fingers. One of the authorities on Stonehenge here says that the one question you cannot ask about Stonehenge is why. Now, are you both asking and answering that question, why? You can't ask why if uh, material objects are involved. You can ask why if people are involved, and so since people built Stonehenge, I think the question why is a very, very good one. And of course, uh, I found the answer. They were very interested in using this to mark the sun and the moon. My answer is it was an observatory, and that's the reason why. As an observatory, now how did it work? This stone that we see through the archway here, it, that's the focal point of it, is it? That's the heel stone. It's 200 feet from us, and it's when you center it in the archway, it marks the midsummer sunrise. Well, does the sun come up directly over the heel stone? Is that the significance of the sunrise at midsummer? Oh, yes. It shoots up to the left, moves over to the right, and then stands directly on top of that stone. And it does the same thing now as it did 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, the sun was a little higher, but the heel stone was tilted more upright. And so, yes, 4,000 years ago, you would, just by luck, be seeing exactly the same thing. Yeah. This theory that the sun, as they observed it, moved along the horizon. How did this uh, show itself in the stones themselves? In July, the sun begins to move around back to the east. And then uh, at uh, the depth of midwinter, it uh, rises through this main sun archway here. At midsummer, the sun would rise over the heel stone. At midwinter, it would be located in this slot to the left. Yeah, but what happened in between? There were no other positions marked. You see, these people followed the extreme positions. The furthest to the north, the furthest to the south. What are all these shafts doing here that circle the uh, place, uh, these 30 stones that stand around the center point? Now, what, what's that signi the significance of those? Many of them are used to mark the rising and setting of the sun and the moon, but the number 30 was chosen for uh, to make a symmetrical structure and to count the uh, days of the month. It, in fact, is a counting system as well as an alignment. Then how does the new moon, or any moon, enter into this counting of the sun? How does the moon come in? Well, the phases of the moon are, are very important to follow. Uh, the whole idea here is the counterplay between the moon and the sun. At full moon, the moon is opposite the sun. When it's directly opposite, an eclipse takes place. So if we follow the moon uh, day by day by marking these slots, we will know when it's going to be full, and we will know when the eclipse will take place. So that slot is a sun slot. It marks the sun at midwinter. The moon uh, sometimes gets in that slot. When it does, an eclipse will take place. Uh, that's the great trilithon. The side companion has fallen down and with it the top, so there's only one sarsen stone left standing. 
That trilithon marks the uh, midwinter sunset. If the 30 pillars simply were a method of counting the days, what's the reason for the number of 56 holes on the outer perimeter? Well, that's a very complicated uh, uh, question. The, the 56 is an eclipse cycle. Every 56 years, we're back in phase with this cycle. And uh, it's my contention that uh, nobody else can explain why there are 56. And uh, it must be that they were counting year by year the years when the eclipse would take place. In other parts of the world, 4,000 years ago, were they at the same level mathematically and astronomically as the people here at Stonehenge? Oh, the British public would be pleased to hear that uh, the ancient Britain was way ahead of the Babylonian in astronomical knowledge, oh, at least 1,000 to 1,500 years. And uh, the Babylonians invented mathematics and could write, but they didn't develop their astronomy until about 500 BC. The timetable of human knowledge thrown a thousand years off. If you want to shake the scientific community, that statement will do it. Personally, I find this very hard to agree with. I'm sure he's right that they could have been used in this way, but this isn't really the point. The point is, were they used in this way? And this means taking into account what we know of the people who built the first Stonehenge, of which these 56 Aubrey holes in a circle are a part. They were not the sort of people who were capable of thinking out something pretty complex of this kind. After all, the lifespan of these people was a great deal shorter than our own. It's very doubtful whether, on the average, anyone would live long enough to observe even one complete cycle. And clearly, you must observe and record several cycles before you can be sure that there's a cycle at all. A Stone Age man would certainly live long enough to see and observe an 18-year cycle. And he would memorize these things as they took place. And by passing them on by word of mouth, an accumulation of knowledge could build up which would be adequate for understanding the complicated movements of the moon. How would they do it? Sagas, poems, Homeric uh, epics, of course, are the first things that come to mind. Writing is an apparently uh, uh, recent invention, and when it uh, began to uh, appear in the, amongst the Greek scholars, knowledge was written in books, a few scholars objected to this vulgarization of their knowledge. And uh, the idea of conserving facts in your mind and transmitting them verbally was a very well-known method and a very popular one in the ancient world. The Aubrey holes belong to the first Stonehenge. The contacts with Greece and with higher and more sophisticated, more scientific civilizations comes only hundreds of years later, when the Aubrey holes, I think, were completely grown over and probably didn't show on the surface at all. They didn't have to get the information from outside. In fact, that information just didn't exist. What was going on at Stonehenge was a thousand years ahead of its time. There are simply 56 holes in the ground, equally spaced in a circle, about 16 feet apart, and, and this is important, I think, for Professor Hawkins's theory, they were filled up almost as soon as they'd been dug. Now, he suggests that these were used as markers in a kind of computer over a long period of time. And my objection to this, it's a purely practical one, is that if you want to set out 56 marks on the ground, it isn't the best way of doing it to dig a lot of holes and then fill them up again. It was a very sensible way of marking these holes. The archaeologists today have dug out the Aubrey holes and rammed the chalk back in place. Result? Nothing grows there. We have a beautiful white spot, a permanent indelible mark. Two men committed to two points of view. But the rest of the scientific world was reacting to Hawkins's theory, and we sought out some of the experts. When you want an expert on astronomy, you go to the Royal Greenwich Observatory. In the three centuries since Charles II founded it, some of the most important discoveries in modern science have come from here. Astronomer Harold Richards. There is no doubt of the astronomical significance of Stonehenge. Professor Hawkins, however, seems to be concerned to prove that the 56 Aubrey holes constitute an eclipse predictor. And there is, I think, no proof 
that such a 56-year cycle does indeed exist. The 56-year cycle was not known to astronomers up until this point. I found it from my Stonehenge work. The 56-year cycle depends on the seasons of the year. The Stonehenges were very interested in seasonal eclipses. Modern-day astronomers have not been. That's the reason that they missed this 56-year cycle. I do have one or two uneasy doubts about it. Because it's always seemed to me that if the builders of Stonehenge knew enough to build an accurate computer of this kind, they would also have known enough to be able to predict eclipses and other phenomena uh, without recourse to building rather large and cumbersome monuments of this kind. There's an easier way to do most things that are spectacular. One doesn't have to have pyramids the size they are, they could be smaller. The Parthenon could be built at ground level. There's an advantage in the large stones at Stonehenge. They're a permanent record. Uh, they don't shift around. And we know that the, the megalithic people just thought big. For some reason, they were obsessed with the idea of setting up these huge megaliths all over the place. And perhaps when they'd finished, uh, they felt that they'd erected something which was there for all men to see. Alexander Tom, Professor Emeritus, Engineering Sciences, Oxford University. These people were much further developed intellectually than is generally recognized. Witness their geometry. These people have left in stone about a dozen ellipses set out on the hillsides and moorlands of Britain. It is generally considered that the ellipse came in with the Greeks, but we have these people showing a knowledge of the ellipse a thousand years earlier. Stuart Piggott, Professor of Prehistory, University of Edinburgh. Uh, just how barbarian is a barbarian? We mustn't, for instance, as I'm afraid an awful lot of people do, think of them as those awful bearded, skin-clad monsters emerging from their caves and shambling about the landscape, which for so many people uh, constitute the whole of prehistoric man. That may be all right for the early phases of, very early phases of prehistoric man, but such people, uh, their cultures were long ago extinct for many thousands of years by the time we are talking about. And we are dealing with chaps and girls who were as handsome as you and me, and indistinguishable from us uh, if they were dressed up in the appropriate clothes. Dr. Frank George, University of Bristol, computer expert. My own feeling is that Stonehenge is un undeniably a computer in the sense that it could be used as such. I think Professor Hawkins's case is absolutely clear here. You could regard Stonehenge as a way of making predictions of an astronomical kind. The whole question, of course, really is whether it was designed as such. This is much more difficult to answer, and this remains the $64 question, if you like. But one thing I think we must be absolutely clear about, when we use a word like computer in this context, we don't mean a huge electronic digital system which are used all over the world today. We mean a simple counting device, and this could be done by collecting matchsticks. It could be done by making marks on rock or anything you like. It could even be done, by, in fact, by making holes in a circle, as they may have done at Stonehenge. Furthermore, it's almost too much of a coincidence to believe the 56 happened by accident. In fact, the sun doesn't rise over the heelstone now, and it never did. By the time the lower part of the sun passes over the heelstone at sunrise on Midsummer Day, it's already well clear of the stone. And this was even more so when Stonehenge was built, because in those days, the sun rose rather to the west of its present position. So the lining up is not at all accurate. And in fact, the sun won't rise directly over the heel stone until the year 3260 AD. So I think this is all rather problematical. The sun does rise over the heel stone. My calculations with this computer show that at midsummer, it stands on the peak of the heel stone. And if I'm right about that one calculation, then all the other 24 alignments are also correct. And if these alignments are correct, then my opinion about Stonehenge as a computer is confirmed. Midsummer, 1964. In most places, that means blue skies. At Stonehenge, the forecast is fog. It was cold and damp as we set up our cameras to try to capture the visual evidence that could confirm Professor Hawkins' theory. Up to now, that theory existed only on paper. 
Dr. Hawkins told us that one picture of the sunrise was all he needed to prove his calculations once and for all. It's a rare morning on Salisbury Plain when the rising sun is not hidden in mist. If it is hidden this morning, Professor Hawkins' theory remains only a theory. But if the sun is visible rising over the heelstone, the 24 alignments keyed to it will each fall into place. If the sun is not visible or is wide of the heelstone, the alignments are meaningless figures on paper. This experiment was filmed exactly as it took place. Our cameras are set to precise specifications, dead center on the Stonehenge axis. We filmed the slow, inexorable path of the sun from where those ancient observers would have stood. And thus, we are now part of a countdown that began 4,000 years ago. Stonehenge man stood here then, tense, expectant, waiting for a god that brought warmth and fertility and life. Now we wait for a door to the past to open, for a fresh insight into the mind of prehistoric man. The sun does rise over the heelstone. Folklore is now fact. Tradition is translated into science and for the first time documented on motion picture film. Based on this experiment, Dr. Hawkins has discovered that his calculations were exact to within one-tenth of a degree. There seems little doubt that Stonehenge was an observatory. Professor Atkinson, while still questioning the idea that Stonehenge was used as a computer to predict eclipses, does credit Hawkins with a new and valuable scientific contribution. Even Dr. Hawkins would agree that we do not yet know the full story. And the search for Stonehenge truth continues. Professor Atkinson plans new excavations in the area around Stonehenge. Professor Hawkins is investigating a stone circle in Scotland and has found sun and moon alignments and rows of stones there that could be used as a counting system. Today, Stonehenge, computer, observatory, call it what you will, is operating on schedule season in, season out. In December, we return to test it again. Professor Hawkins had told us that the Stonehenge computer predicted an eclipse of the full moon on the 19th. Our cameras were there, and we were not disappointed. This is the arch that marks the midwinter sunrise. On another cold December day, we positioned ourselves at dawn to film through the arch. The sun centered in the slot exactly as predicted.
evening midwinter. If the observatory is in order, the sun should set in the arch of the great trilithon. The trilithon is half fallen now, but the sun keeps its ancient appointment. For the people who built it, Stonehenge was an expression of their idea of the meaning of life, guided by the universal rhythm which controls all things. For them, science and religion were one. Stonehenge is a monument to man's faith as well as to the power of his imagination. We've begun to penetrate the mystery of Stonehenge and find it linked to the eternal mystery of our place in the universe. This is Charles Collingwood. Good night.